my punishment for whatever sin I committed would be to just push my bike uphill in the snow for all eternity. <laughs> Sofiane, welcome to the Romance Cycling Podcast. Hey, Anthony. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, every time I chat to somebody who is an ultra-endurance cyclist, they just are beautifully, crisply suntanned. It's one of like the occupational <laughs> hazards of being an ultra-endurance cyclist. Yeah. Uh, can you see the, the tan on my hand? It's nicely nicely layered yeah, it is yeah i mean we're, we spend all our time on the road so if you catch us in uh, in september for sure october it's october now if you catch us in october for sure we're gonna have a nice nice suntan i just i just uh finished a, a tour of uh corsica sardinia and sicily so um, yeah lots of sun in the in the last last was, few weeks was that a race or was that like a self-supported adventure it was a vacation, actually. <laughs> so basically, basically, my job my job is riding my bike, and my vacation is riding riding my bike as well. So, how did you make the transition to being a you know in gravel? They call them like privateers. You know, it's not someone that's contracted to ride for a team, but someone who rides their bike full time for a living. So, I'm not sure if there's a different ultra word than privateer. Yeah, we don't really have that word in uh, in ultra. We don't really ha actually have any word. Uh, there's really few people that ride ultra cycling and that are professionals. Um, like there's probably I don't know a handful, like maybe ten or twelve. So we don't really have a, a, a special word that we use uh, to describe uh, what we do, what, who we are. You need to come up with a cool French word for it. <laughs> yeah, I'll. I'll... I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love the way French just have these terms that are just so difficult to translate into English. And one of the ones my old director of my French team used to just constantly bang into me was le métier. Like all the time oh, yeah. I'm trying to be like le métier, le métier, le métier. Yeah, but it, ju yeah. it just seemed like to be the answer for anything. And I, I don't even know what the English translation is. Is it like hard work, dedication to a craft? Or I'm, I'm not sure what the English translation is. It's, it's yeah not even it's i i would translate it i would say that it's it's um all of the little things that you learn while doing a job and that you can only, only learn while doing it and yeah. you cannot learn um like in any other way and that is what they they call le métier like when you say le métier qui rentre it's when you you're actually applying yourself at a craft and by you know uh doing it you have that experience i would say yeah it's it's something like experience it's such a cool word it's one that stuck with me and it's just uh, it instantly when i hear it, it transports me back to being in a tiny little town in france having no money just sore legs all day long and it's amazing the power of just one word to trans transport you back to a moment in time yeah, yeah, definitely, and um, happens also to me with uh, with the uh, music, like some uh, some songs. When I hear them, I just get like really transported back to like one one place, one moment. It's just like it's uh, or some smells also. It's a uh, it's a funny way that the memory works. Like you're some, like some things are just imprinted in your brain. You're like sixteen at the like, discotheque again, just throwing it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just press that little button and it's just like time travel. How did you get into ultra cycling? Because it seems like, you know, most kids, especially French kids, cycling is so popular culture over there. But the vision or the goal, I would assume for most French kids is Le Tour de France. And uh, So ultra cycling seems a strange offshoot of that vision. What was your sort of intro to it or first exposure to it? Yeah, I mean, I would say like as a typical French kid, I would spend my my month of July watching the Tour de France for sure. But I grew up in a quite a poor family, and we couldn't really afford uh, um, having.
letting me, you know, ride expensive bikes. And so I never so I mean, I knew that cycling was a sport, but for me, it always turned out to be just a, a, a means of transportation. And um, I never I mean, I rode bikes uh, pretty much all my all my life. And, and as a kid, like all the kids like riding bikes anyway. But like I was um, I was doing actual I was swimming. I was a swimmer. At the at that time, because I had back problems, and and the doctor told my mom that I needed to to have a stronger back, like more muscly, and that the swimming would be the the right the right thing to do, and um yeah, so I just saw my bike, I just uh, uh, I mean to go from point A to point B, and uh, and then what happened is that uh, in um, twenty ten, uh, I went on a trip. A backpacking trip in Asia, and after like a week of traveling, I I kind of felt that something was missing, uh, that it was not the adventure that I had uh, dreamt, and um, and that I needed to to change the way that I was traveling, and I bought like a secondhand mountain bike in a in a rental shop, and then I started. You know, by touring uh, all over Southeast Asia, and this is how everything happened and everything changed. And um, the way that I got to ultra cycling is actually uh, through bike touring, um, and it was quite a late something that happened late in my life. I am forty now; um, will soon be forty-one, and yeah, I came to ultra cycling like six years ago, and the first time that I raced. Um, in ultra cycling was actually the first time that I raced, period. Well, oh, that's amazing. I had assumed you were, you know, coming up through the French system, racing Division Nationale, and then made the transition across. Yeah, I know. I, I actually, um, there was like this one, this first step that was, you know, discovering bike touring, and, and then it did, didn't really change the, the nature of, of, of the bike, the bike was still at that time um, just a mean of transportation and, and a way to get from one place to another. Um, and then there was another defining moment is uh, after several bike long bike tours, like month long bike tours, I got back to Paris and I needed a job and I couldn't, I find that I couldn't uh, get, um, I couldn't spend more time in an office job that it would really it was really just too hard for me after spending so much time uh outside on my bike it was too hard for me just to be like in an office and not seeing the sky and having the sky above me that was too hard so that's when i became a, a bike messenger and by becoming a bike messenger um i met other keen cyclists obviously and then I, I found out that I had, um, I would say, above average abilities as, as, as far as cycling goes. And then, yeah, when I heard about these crazy races that last for thousands of kilometers, I was like, it's, it's still going from point A to point B. It's like bike touring pushed to to the max to like uh this this limit and and then i was like i know i'm a good cyclist i know i'm fast i know i have the endurance and i kind of wanted to to figure out what i would be able to do um in in one of these races and i started with probably what was at that time the hardest race and i did well because i finished third and then I was hooked. I was like, yeah, this is what I want to do. But I can totally hear when you're talking about the transition from, you know, doing these big bike packing adventures to going back into the office. Uh, last week or the week before, I was over in Spain, uh, signed up around Badlands. And then after Badlands, myself and a buddy decided to ride north from Granada all the way through Spain to Biarritz had a night in Biarritz and then we rode across to Girona. So we like just shy of 2000 kilometers. 
on the ride. And so we were away for, you know, two and a half, three weeks, biking almost every day, you know, figuring out where to sleep on the fly. And then I came home and it's, it's difficult to explain to somebody who hasn't bike packed, but it's like the volume is turned down on the rest of your life. It's like you're used to adventures. You're used to stimulation. You're used to the open air and the sunshine. And then I'm coming back into my normal routine of recording podcasts in a small little studio with artificial light. And that transition is difficult. I I don't think it's a nice transition. I, I struggled with it for the week I came home. Yeah, it's hard, and, you know, I don't suffer from it, but I know that uh, a lot of of people that race ultra, they, like, they do the race, and I would say for two weeks, maybe a month after, they have a form of depression, you know, Uh, because for that, that period of time, the bike is all you have it's all you do and it's very meaningful i feel that when you're out whether it's racing or bike packing it's very meaningful and all of them you know not very all of the meaning meaningless things that you usually have uh, in your life all of the you know tiny decisions that you have to make every day um, they're not there. You know, when you wake up, it's like, what am I going to do today? I'm going to run my bike. What am I going to wear? Well, you're going to wear your your chamois and, and your jersey. And I mean, if you're like me, you just you, you just have one. So the decision is all made. You have one outfit for riding and one outfit for not riding. And it's pretty much, yeah, everything is, is it's not <laughs> physically easy because you're riding your bike all the time which is hard but it's 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 mentally very easy because all of the decisions are are, are made uh, uh when the day starts like you you wake up you get your breakfast you get you get dressed you get on your bike and you have this mission for the day and this mission is to get from point a to point b and obviously when you reach point b you're quite proud of yourself because uh yeah that was quite far and you did it, you did it by your your own power and you do this for a period of time and it becomes your whole life and then you have to make yeah. that transition to okay now uh i'm doing something else it might not be as meaningful it might not seem as important whereas if you're out there say that you you're bikepacking and you've you've uh, um, plan on getting to that space, that that town where you can resupply, where you can sleep, and before that, there's nothing. Well, you have to do it, otherwise, you're not going to be able to resupply. You know, you you know, you're going to be out there yeah. without any food, any water. So it's it's actually quite important that you reach the goal that you set in the morning. And there's no. And for me, it was also uh, kind of, it was a weird way of shining a light on some of my own habits and society at large's habits. Like we're in this materialistic game of consumption where we need a new couch, we need a bigger TV, we need a nicer car, and when you start bike packing. It's the exact opposite mentality because I started out the trip with a set of flip flops. I lost them after 10 kilometers and I was like, okay, well, there goes the flip flops. You realize life is a game of having less, not a game of having more. And it's seeing how you can strip down your material possessions, not how you can add to the material possessions. I didn't go to the next town and buy flip flops or runners. I was like, okay, I guess I'm without flip flops. Now I'm going to have to wear my bike shoes in the evening going to the bar. And it's a beautiful lens to view the world through. Yeah, it's very true. It's very true that we're in this world where they're always trying to sell us stuff, and we're and a lot of people are trying to um, feel more complete by buying them. Um, whereas when you're on when you're on the bike, well, everything that you carry, you're gonna have to carry up all the passes that you're gonna cycle. <laughs> so you don't want to carry anything that is like not necessary and so you learn how to be a minimalist you learn how to just know okay like 
is it nice like what i i look at my my uh uh at uh all my jerseys yeah i like them i like to just like to all all to have different colors and, and different styles and it's it, in a way it's nice but am i gonna carry all of them when i when i like i'm gonna have like seven eight jerseys when i cycle no i'm not gonna do that i'm just i'm gonna have one two tops and it's it's enough and you find out that yeah it's enough and actually maybe when you put on your your nice new jersey that one time in the morning you're like oh yeah it's nice uh to wear it for the first time or oh like you like that color but actually yeah then you go out on your bike do you think of your nice jersey all the time no you just think of you know all the stuff that you, you think of when you're when you're cycling and you're and then what that's what happens when you go on a on a, on a bike tour when you go bike packing you find out that you don't need that much actually in a day yeah you just need the clothes on your back, and uh, obviously you need your bike too. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not gonna go far. But yeah, there's just just a, a a lot of stuff, and it's the same for the bike you're riding. You know, like I'm 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 a cyclist, so I'm like all cyclist, which is I'm you know fascinated by all, and 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 really attracted by all the the new stuff and the and the and the you know, lighter, faster, and it's all the new technology. I'm I, every time that something else, uh, something new <clears throat> comes out, I, I I read about it and I'm like, yeah, this 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 is very interesting. But but also, bike packing yeah. seems to have its own like sector of tech, and I was totally unaware of this before I went into Badlands because. I ended up making life harder for myself because I went in with like battery powered lights. And then on the first day I see one of my friends and he's like running a dynamo and I'm like, what? This is like, you can run a dynamo. This is, I haven't seen these since like 1990s. So my dad used to build bikes. I'm like, these exist. And people were using solar powered garments. Yeah. Like I'm running around with a 20,000 amp hour battery. That's like carrying, you know, a house brick up the climbs. And you guys just have this, you know, the subsection of tech for ultra endurance dialed. And I don't think roadies or gravel riders are as plugged into those tech advancements. Yeah. It's a, it's, um, it's interesting actually to, to, to look at all the things people do in, in bike packing. It's like, there's, Bike packing is about problem solving. It's you're gonna be on your bike for you know eighteen hours a day, uh, and so you're gonna face some challenges that you know just conventional uh, road cyclists are not gonna face. And it's very interesting. And also, it's 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 a very niche part of cycling right now. So you have to you have to sometimes solve these problems yourself. I mean, you're looking at all the tech, but sometimes the tech is not enough and you need to come up with your own solutions. And what I think is fascinating uh, about bikepacking, it's like there's not one solution to every problem. And then, and if you look at all the setups at Badlands, some people will have battery lights, some people will have Dynamo, some people, you, you talked about the solar garments, some people will have, um, for example, I don't even use the same setup the uh for two races like some some races i'm gonna use my dynamo other ones i'm gonna use a uh, uh, battery light and power banks and just about adapting um the bike that you have and the gear that you have it's about you know trying to to find what's gonna work best for the event that you're racing um and it's always have you had bad mechanicals on the road yeah yeah uh i never had like a race ending mechanical never ever i uh always managed to finish all of my races um but yeah this one time i had uh, uh a problem with my wheel where the the the, the wheel had been rebuilt because there had been a, a a problem with the with the hub at the at the the start and um the guy that rebuilt the wheel it used the same spoke just despite the fact that it was a different hub and uh actually the spokes were two mil uh too short 
and after a bit more than a thousand k um the the nipples started breaking and oh, i found no. myself somewhere in kyrgyzstan at an altitude close to four thousand meters at night uh having to deal with the uh, uh rear wheel that was missing uh five nipples so five spokes and uh, how do you fix that problem on the go i so basically i could i could hear the the nipples breaking like one two three four and when the fifth one broke the wheel can uh turn anymore because it was rubbing on the was rubbing on the frame and so what i did so all the all the nipples were breaking on the on the drive side so what i did is that i unlaced a couple spokes that were on the non-drive side and less into the to, to the to the drive side and um, then i was able to keep riding a little bit and then i managed to find a a, a taxi to the nearest town and in the nearest nearest town i went to um to hardware store and i was lucky that they had spoke nipples and so i replaced I re completely relaced the wheel and replaced all the nipples, and then I was good to go. Uh, You've got to be a pretty proficient bike mechanic for bike pack and our ultra distance. Yeah, definitely. And like, if I had no notions of wheel bending at all, it would have meant that you know my race would have been over. Uh, and yeah, it's a uh, it's it's a uh, competence that is is really useful to have like if you're able to do pretty much i do pretty much everything on my bike um there's problem yeah no i never go to the bike shop actually i do everything um and yeah it's it's uh it's, it can save you in a race like if you're if you know your 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 bike in and out if you're able to 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 first off knowing what's wrong and then fixing it then it's just something that is going to help you somewhere down the road because at some point you're going to have mechanicals it happens to everyone and if you're able to to fix it by yourself, uh, you mentioned kyrgyzstan and your you won silk road mountain race congratulations uh for anyone that doesn't know it's like what's it 1900 kilometers thirty-seven thousand meters of climbing yeah. the videos of it just look wild like they look like from a different universe what's it like to to kind of stand on the start line and know that you're facing into such a mammoth task um i mean so i raced it twice last year and this year and i won it twice um standing on the start line was exciting actually uh i knew i knew that it would be a really hard race and probably the hardest one um but it's just for sure it's a mammoth task but that's why we do it you know ultra cyclist we want the the ultimate challenge we want to be um in the most remote place possible and climb the highest mountains and it's like if you don't have that taste for challenging yourself to to you know what is the hardest possible thing that you can do you're probably not going to go into ultra cycling and, and so what was your win in time for silk road mountain race uh i think last year it was a bit more than eight days like eight and a half uh and this year it was uh just a little bit over seven days and how much sleep are you getting across those seven days uh, so this year I slept, uh, I didn't sleep for, I think like three nights, like the first night, cause we started at midnight. So for sure I didn't sleep the first night. Uh, nobody, nobody did actually. Then I slept, uh, another three nights and then I needed to, I needed to place like what would be an attack, you know? And, um, so I cut out three hours of sleep and just slept for an hour. Um, and then the last night I was kind of in the sprint finish with uh, James Hayden. And so I didn't sleep either. So that's 
um, yeah, two complete sleepless nights and one night that was just one hour. And does your mind go to a strange place when you're going without sleep or does your decision making falter or have you noticed any sort of ill effects of it? Um, if you, I mean, on other races, I've pushed uh, sleep deprivation much, much further than this. And uh, the worst that happened to me was going in sort of delirium. Uh, it happened to me twice. It happened to me in Italy and it happened to me uh, in Switzerland on shorter races. And on shorter races, I tend to, re- I tend, well, maybe I wouldn't do it anymore, but uh, I, I, I cut back on sleep like really, really a lot, not sleeping at all for several days, like three or four days. And yeah, you can go into a sort of delirium, and I I, I talked about that with uh, a friend of mine that is an anthracyclist as well, and we had that same experience where we thought we were dead. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not really good. But like, I was I remember I was in I was in Italy, and I was and I was pushing my it was it was beginning of May or end of April, like like second or third of May and something like that. And I was pushing my bike in the snow up that pass. And it was snowing at that time. And I hadn't, I hadn't slept for several days. And I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea where I was going. And I started to think, well, it's, I don't think it's possible that it snows in Italy in spring. So <laughs> something is really odd. Something is really wrong there. And then I was like, I'm probably dead actually. And I started to think, yeah, <laughs> it makes sense that I would be dead, and that this would be hell, and that my punishment for whatever sin I committed would be to just push my bike uphill in the snow for all eternity, just like Sisyphus. <laughs> and I had this real debate going on where one part of me was really convinced that I was dead, and the other part was like, it's kind of weird because it looks like I'm dead, but I'm getting <laughs> messages on WhatsApp. So maybe not. You know? uh, so yeah, that was that was weird. So, uh, but yeah, it happens after like, you know, you know four days of sleep deprivation. So is it like a total out-of-body experience almost? Like, you're, like you've drank a lot and you're in a nightclub and you you know what's going on, but you also can't really place yourself there and you're not sure, you know, how you fit into this scenario and you're like, are they my hands? I can see them. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was kind of, you know, it was, it was different from other experience that I had because I was, I was aware of, um, where I was of my surroundings and I was aware of what I was doing. But I had another one in Switzerland where I wasn't aware of anything, just nothing. I was just following the line of my GPS, and I had no idea what this line was. <laughs> and I kind of felt like I was cycling, you know, I was pedaling. But I kind of felt I had no idea why why my legs were moving or what kind of movement they were making. I was kind of like, am I running or something like that? My legs are moving. I don't know what's happening. And then I had, a, again, a debate in my head where, you know, part of my brain was like, you should really try and stop now. You should really stop now whatever you are doing because it's, there is no point in doing it. And then there was the other part of my brain that was like, there is this line. And it was the line on my GPS, but I was not even aware that it was a line on my GPS. I was just aware that there was a line and that was supposed to stay on this line, and I was supposed to keep doing whatever it was that I was doing. But it was like the minimum, like yeah, the minimum that you can you can actually be aware of, and while keep keeping on cycling in the right direction. It's a it like, wild sport. Like I don't know if there's any sports that bring yeah. people to that level of and then i looked at i looked at the i looked at the data afterwards because i was curious when i you know, you know the race ended i got some sleep i, I, I remember that part of the race of like what happened and then i went back and i looked at the data and i think i was i was averaging like five kilometers per hour or something like that because i was oh, that's rough 
I was just, yeah, I was, I had just n no idea what I was doing. I just knew, okay, stay on the line and whatever you, the, the movement that your legs are doing, keep doing it. And that was all. Like the very nature of the adventure race and bike packing, you're trying to find that line between safety and danger, between adventure and something that's curated and manicured. So at times you're going to step across that line to a point that it's like, oh shit, I've actually gone way too far into the danger zone here. I put myself in real physical jeopardy. Have you had those moments where you're like, I'm in, I'm in trouble here. I'm in real trouble. Yeah. It happened to me once where I actually feared for my life. And actually the one time that it happened, it's the only time that I dropped out of race. I was um, in uh, USA, I was in Colorado, and uh, I was climbing this pass, and for me it was, you know, it was just, I was just obsessed by forward movement, as I was, I was in first position, but there was a guy that was like right behind me, like probably 10 or 10 or 20k right behind me, and so it was like, I, I need to keep moving, otherwise he's going to catch me, and I started climbing that pass and the bottom of the pass was okay. But then it was, um, as I got close to, I would say probably 2,500 meters, it was covered in snow. And so I had to get off the bike and I started walking in the snow, uh, post holing in that snow. And then I got close to the top of the pass. It was dark. I, I, I forgot to mention that it was dark. And I get to the top of that pass. And it was completely white out. Like for the whole climb, I could find my way because there was trees on my right and on my left. I was like, all right, I just need to, I, I just need to stay behind the trees. And I also forget to mention that the, the GPS track that we were giving for the race was um, not super accurate, you know? Uh, some uh, some of the tracks you, you you follow them they're you know they have you know that number of points that means they're extremely accurate and they're really easy to follow this one was not extremely easy to follow was not super accurate and then I find myself at the top of the climb trying to follow that line on my GPS it's completely it's like a small plateau it's completely white out and also it's dark and I have no idea where I'm going. I'm, I start following the line my GPS, and then I end up in the trees in a place where obviously I can't keep going. And so I was up there, 3,000 meters of altitude. It was snowing. It was dark. And I had no idea where to go. Couldn't find the, couldn't find the, the trail at all. And temperature was minus 5. But then it was windy, so I would say it was more like minus 10. And I was wet, obviously, from all the walking. And that's a tough, that's a tough, tough spot to be in. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like, okay, I can't, I can't risk it, which is like pick a direction and get in that direction. Because if I get lost here, if I have no idea where I'm going, it's, it's just too dangerous, you know, to be completely lost in that snow in that in that in that snowstorm it's just too dangerous i can't do that so i need to wait um for uh dawn when it's gonna be light and maybe i can see the trail and so i got in my sleeping bag um with an emergency blanket and i stayed there for like i don't know a couple of hours but i was shivering there was no way that i could get any sleep and my temperature my body temperature was dropping and after a couple of hours of shivering in my sleeping area, I was like, I was like, I can't do that. It's just too risky. Just to stay there. It's getting colder and colder. Uh, and I have no idea where the trail is. And I decided that, you know, the safest thing to do was actually to backtrack the, 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 I had my, my own tracks that I could follow. So I know I would not get lost. And I knew that I could get back to safety. Uh, and then I was like, okay, I, I grew up, I'm a city boy. I grew up in Paris. I'm not used to the kind of, <laughs> of, you know, extreme weather and hostile environment. And 
I'm not sure that I'm going to do what's right to survive. So better to pull the plug and, you know, backtrack and get back to some place where I know it's safe. And, uh, and once it's even interesting, the idea of pulling the plug, because if you pull the plug in a road race, you get picked up by the car yeah. behind, <laughs> you pull the plug in an ultra endurance race, you've still got a lot of survival to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and sometimes it's actually why you don't pull the plug is because you, you can't even do it. There's like when I had my mechanical on, uh, on the Silk Road last year. Um, so when you have a problem on this race, uh, you can actually send a message to, to the organization and your organization organizes a, a taxi that's going to come and pick you up. It will take several hours because it's a, it's a big country with just very, very bad roads and, and very bad cars as well. But at some point, you know, if you're patient enough, a, a taxi is going to pick you up. But there were last year and every year, actually, there is parts of the race where it's not possible just because a car cannot physically get to where you are. And when I had my mechanical, I was in one of the two spots where it was impossible to get picked up by a taxi. Uh, and then I was like, yeah, I don't even have that option of pulling the plug. I don't even have that option of dropping out because if I drop out, nothing is going to happen. I'm just, I just need, I, whatever I do, I need to move forward and find a solution by myself because no one's going to find a solution for me. But again, like ultra is just so full of amazing metaphors for life. Like, isn't that such a cool one? Like you need to move forward and find solutions. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, um, it's something that I'm I'm used to because I um I come from bike touring and I started bike touring with uh very little money and so I had secondhand bikes and you know secondhand bikes that you buy in in Laos they're gonna break at some point and you know whatever happened during these bike tours I always got faced with the, these challenges of having to find solutions to to keep on moving forward. And so it's a, it's a spirit, it's a mentality that I have always had on the bike that, um, you've had, you've had these, uh, you've had some epic results, like, you know, winning Silk Road mountain race, winning Tour de Voids, you know, I think you were a top five in Badlands, Atlas mountain race, another victory there. Is there one performance? It doesn't necessarily have to be a race that you won, but is there a performance you're proudest of? Um... I would say the Atlas Mountain Race uh, that I won in twenty twenty. I was I was super proud of it uh, because I had this game plan and I implemented it and I had the strategy and it and it worked out perfectly and I ended up, you know, I showed up at the start line feeling like I could win this. I knew I knew it would be um a really, really tough race with some really, really strong competition. And I was like, I think I can do it. I have this game plan. If I if I implement it and if anything everything goes well, I think I can I can finish first. And and it worked out and I was I was really happy because it was my biggest victory at that time. There was some really, really strong guys like Jane Tatum, uh, Jay Peter Berry. There was also some former pro racers like Matia Domaraki and Christian Mayer. And it was a really, really strong field. And for me, just to be able to to win um, on on this course that was really hard with such a strong field, um, that was a huge, huge uh, accomplishment. And at that time, I was I was pretty much unknown. And this is when I, 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 I kind of burst onto the scene and people, you know, started noticing me. They're like, oh, OK, there's this guy and he won in one Atlas mountain race. And it was it was packed with a lot of real, real strong racers. And it was um, like my first... was that the race that allowed you to do this full time? Uh, kind of. I, it's it's 
after that race, I started getting sponsors. And then I kept, you know, kept racing, kept winning. And then the, the so it was in 2020. And then in 2021, I, uh, I managed to, to get enough sponsors to quit my job as a bike courier. And, um, and now Amazing. I'm in my second year as a, as a professional, you know, bike hacker, ultra endurance, whatever. Yeah. We still haven't figured out the word for it. What's the French word for privateer? That could be a cool word for it. Uh, I think it's Corsair. Cause privateer, like, yeah. uh, I think privateers are, are, uh, pirates, right? I think so. I think that's where it comes from. Yeah. I think they are pirates that were like contracted by actual governments and i think that the um, the french the french term is corsair which is a cool word what's amazing it's a real cool world i'm gonna start using it now uh but what, what's so amazing at the moment in cycling is it's it, there used to be hard verticals hard lines between road cycling mountain biking cyclocross gravel bike touring these lines are all getting very blurry you're getting road cyclists coming in and doing gravel races, gravel guys starting to bike pack, bike packers doing ultra endurance. And it's brilliant because it's it's still a niche sport. You know, it feels like the world to me and it feels like the world to you, but it's not soccer. It's not American football. It's a small sport. And it's great to see this cycling community breaking down those walls of division and starting to become just one homogenous community. Yeah. and and. Definitely, it's a lifestyle too, um, and I know that once you get into into cycling, it's it's um it's a sport that you have to use a bike too, and the bike is a fascinating object, and you know what I often tell is that the bike is my life because as I told you earlier in the show, it's it's uh. uh how I make my living and how I've made my living for a long time now, because uh, also I was a bike messenger before. Um, it's also my vacation and it's, it's been my vacation for the last 10 years. Like every time I go on a, a, a on a trip for me, a, any vacation is going to have cycling in it. And I'm also just, just passionate about the object. I love just, you know, taking care of my bike and, and taking care, taking care of the, uh, of my girlfriend's bike. And, just you know spending an entire afternoon just uh you know you change your cassette you chain you just uh change all the all the cables and stuff yeah. like that that i love that i love doing that and it's just it's just i feel it's much more yeah it's a sport but it's much more than a sport i mean and it can it can actually become your your whole life to the point that at at some time it was like isn't it too much? You know, it's a it's a lot when you when you spend all your time just either riding your bike or taking care of your bikes. At some at some point, I was like, isn't it? Isn't life? Shouldn't life be about you know more than this one thing? And then I figured, well, for a lot of people, life isn't about anything. You know, so for a lot of people that just don't have any passion. So having that passion, even if it fills up your whole life, well, it's, it's I'm going to say, why not? It's, it's actually really cool to have that one thing that you love, that you love so much. And I think this is why um, people are starting to, you know, to cross these lines that you were talking about, because they, they, they find out that sure you're racing on road. That's great. But you can also you can also you know do that same thing on gravel and it's going to be similar but different and then you can you know try it on a mountain bike and it's going to be you know even more different and you can use you know the gravel as kind of a bridge between you know road and mountain biking and you're going to find that and I love all of them you know I can like keep to one discipline I couldn't be like, all right, from now on, I'm just going to do just mountain biking or from now on, I'm just going to do road cycling. I need, I need them all. I need, you know, the gravel, the road, the mountain bike, they all offer their own thing that is unique and, and 
you know, I was I was on a on a road biking tour like for one week, and then sometimes I would see this gravel trail in the distance. I would be like, wow, yeah, I need to come back here with my with my gravel bike, and it's just like. Well, even to build on how all encompassing you see the bike as in your life, I've also I've spent a lot of time, you know, talking through the podcast is like therapy sessions for me at times. You know, I totally forget other people listen yeah. to this. For me, this is just you and me having a conversation about cycling. And when I when I start thinking more about it, it's like the bike. It's such a simple solution to some of the most complex problems we have in the world. Like we've some of the smartest minds in the world trying to figure out traffic congestion. Elon Musk digging tunnels under L.A. The bike fixes that to reduce obesity. The bike figures that. We pharmaceutical companies talking about how do we, you know, improve happiness levels through pills like serotonin. Well, the bike largely fixes a lot of that too. And it's like such a simple, simple tool, but it has such amazing applications across the whole of society. Yeah, it's it is it is so true. It is so true. And you just need to look at cyclists and and even at at like people that used to be non-cyclists and they became cyclists and you have a lot of them in, in, in Paris because Paris used to be awful to cycle because there was no cycling path. There was a lot of traffic and the drivers would not, would not be careful. And it changed because there was a, this political uh, um, will to change that. And they started to build bike lanes. And at first the bike lanes were empty. But soon enough, you know, if you have the infrastructure, people are going to use it. You know, it was, it was, it was a fun time. It was like, you had all of these motorists that were really mad at the mayor because they could see the bike lanes and the bike lanes were empty. And all the cyclists were like, just wait, just wait. And you're going to see what's going to happen. <laughs> and now all of the bike lanes are just full because you need, you just, you just need a little bit of time you have infrastructure, the cyclists are going to come. And now just Paris has changed so much and it's becoming a cycling town, which is absolutely awesome. And yeah, I mean, it's it's just true that it fixes a lot of problems and people that used to be in like in the metro, in the subway, they couldn't go back there anymore. They're just like they used to commute you know, underground in that train where everybody's unhappy, everybody's aggressive, and now they're on the surface. They have the they have the the sun, the sky, and they're just you know exercising, and they get to they get to their office faster and happier. And I mean, I know it, you know it, and we just wish that you know everybody knew it. But it's gonna take it's gonna take some time. But I feel it's happening. I mean. You just look at the boom that the bike industry is has experienced last last year and the and the and this year, and obviously more and more people cycle and more and more people are gonna cycle and it's it's important that we keep developing this not even just the sport but the yeah as a mean of transportation and and we keep the you know the kids interested in 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 cycling and it's just gonna make earth a better place so you know the more cyclists that you have and the and the, and the better it is so and just to finish up final question so we were talking about that sort of uh, erosion from one to the other so actually i'm kind of asking this as a selfish question so my experience is being rode into gravel dipping the toe in ultra stuff at badlands if I'm choosing a next race or someone similar to me is choosing a next event, like what would you recommend? The Silk Road mountain bike race, Tour de Void, Atlas mountain race, which of those is the next entry point? I say um, if, you, if you come from, from Badlands, um, I would say Atlas mountain race because, uh, I mean, obviously you, it is possible to just complete Silk Road Mountain Race without any old previous ultra cycling experience. Uh, people have done it, but I would say if you want to follow like a logical evolution and, and go at it step by step, 
um, Atlas uh, would be the next logical step because it's um, 12,000 K, so it's long. It's definitely longer than that, than Badlands, but it's going to be yeah, probably twice as long as as uh, the time that you needed to complete Badlands. And it's going to offer some of the challenges that you're going to find in, in Silk Road, for example, but it's not going to offer all of the challenges. I mean, the weather is not going to be as extreme. The, the, the altitude is not going to be, you know, a problem because you're not going to go as high. It's it's remote, but it's not like crazy remote. Like in Silk Road Mountain Race, you can have like 200K without anything, no chance of resupplying. Whereas in Morocco, it's more, it's more going to be like 100, maybe 120K. So it's going to be plenty challenging for sure. Atlas is hard, um, but it's I, I would say Badlands is a great way to dip your toe into ultra cycling. And then, yeah, I feel like if you do it and if you like it, then you can, you know, be, you can you know, follow that path with Atlas Mountain Race and be like, yeah, okay, I feel like I'm ready to do something that is longer, that is harder. Uh, but it's, it's not going to be as extreme as Silk Road, where Silk Road is amazing. Silk Road is just a, a, a beautiful, rewarding adventure, but it's also extremely hard. And it's, it's also going to face you with pretty much all of the challenges that ultra cycling offers. And so if you want to go at it, like step by step, uh, probably wait. What are the two year plan? Yeah, definitely. I would say that. And then you go. <laughs> so in, uh, thank you very much for chatting. Uh, I don't think I've laughed as hard on the podcast in a long time as I have about your story about like wrestling with the idea of am I alive or am I dead <laughs> in the snow? That was brilliant. Thanks for chatting. Well, thanks for having me on the podcast, Anthony. Cheers, buddy. That was really good. I enjoyed chatting so much. Yeah, that was nice. It was it was very different from the from the podcast that I, that I usually do, and that was a, a nice change, actually. Thanks. Yeah, it's super easy, informal chat. But the podcast is like blown up the last you know seven eight months or over a hundred thousand yeah. people listening to it now. Uh, so it's kind of like your transition points win an Atlas mountain race. I'm like almost making that transition point to the podcast is like the only thing that I'm doing at the moment. So, uh, kind of my, my goal is to go and do cool races like Atlas mountain bike race and talk about it on the podcast and then like talk about my preparation, do the race and then come back and talk about how the race went and give kind of that insight into the race, like rather, cause I'm not a journalist. I'm just like a bike rider with a podcast. So how did Badlands go? actually went shit uh because yeah. my di2 busted so i didn't finish so i was on team category and di2 busted and rode it for a few more hours and then it was like nah this walking with it carrying the bike up hills and going i'm gonna be walking for seven days here so i gotta go back out and do badlands next year as well yeah so I heard the it's gonna be yeah was a bit faster this year yeah i think it was yeah they took out some of the the harder hike bike sections oh, yeah. uh so actually, a, a quick one for you before I go. My buddy that uh, done Badlands with me because we're in the team category, uh, we're, we're almost a month finished now. He still has numb fingers from it. Do you ever experience that? Yeah, yeah, that's very common. It takes, uh, yeah, it can take uh, up to two or three months to go away. Usually for me, it, it goes away. If I don't do anything, it goes away for after like a month or, or so. But it can be, yeah, it can, it can take... A bit more time than this, but it's very common. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a weird one. I guess it's just from reduced circulation. It's it's uh the, there's a nerve here, the ulnar nerve, and it's compressed. You know when you spend a lot of time on the on the handlebars, and it the, it conducts the the feeling in your in your fingers, and so when it gets compressed, that that's when you lose the. The feeling at the tip of your fingers and usually starts with the little one and then uh you don't really lose it on your thumb but you know it goes like this 
Interesting, interesting. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll hit you up. I think I'm following you already on Instagram. If I'm not, I'll follow you now. Uh, but definitely stay in touch. And if you're doing any cool races, you know, jump back on the podcast, talk about your how your prep is going, talk about you yeah. know your hopes for them. So you're welcome back anytime. It was a great laugh. I love chatting. Sure.